much more about in the musty understories of all these libraries because the younger people in this room don't know that you couldn't just download everything at your computer. If you wanted to go learn about something you didn't know about, you had to go find a journal, find who they referenced, go back through the decades and decades of reading papers. And I think we valued it more at the time when you spent a whole day to find the papers. Um, but it's no less important to know the, the field and to know the area. And of course, Dan's willingness to let me do that and uh, to you know, kind of creatively think about this problem of how enzymes came to be that, that allowed him to gain those insights into catalytic promiscuity. And I thought this was a fun little chapter of my life and that you know, I'd never have to think about this again. But I did also want to point out, Suzanne, uh, working with me, did find an example of catalytic promiscuity in the DNA repair enzymes. And so you think you won't worry about this again, but things come back. And so this is just Dan's like, you know, kind of laughing at me that you, know, you, know, you can't really ever get away from your roots. And I just thought I'd point out, these are DNA repair glycosylases that remove damaged faces from the DNA backbone by cleaving that end glycosidic bonds, Suzanne showed they will also cleave carbon-oxygen bonds, and the rate enhancements for these reactions are actually almost identical for a human repair enzyme, and a bacterial enzyme that has a different protein fold and a different catalytic mechanism actually prefers this alternative carbon-oxygen cleavage over what we think of as the DNA repair mechanisms. And so I think you know, kind of throughout biology, we will see these types of connections where the promiscuitive enzymes allow for new activities. Another thing I spent a lot of time on, and people in this room will relate, is worrying about where all those protons are, and you know, <laughs> trying to reconcile all the observations in the field. And you know, a luxury of you know of being a graduate student of time is, uh, you know, I joined this project in the 90s. This this enzyme was discovered in the 40s, and so there are papers published for decades and decades. And that was actually the key enzyme to Bob Lehman's discovery of DNA ligase, because this enzyme was what allowed a coupled assay for an enzyme that would ligate together DNA ends. Um, and so it's kind of really well known, and so there's been lots of, uh, of research done on it. I think with Dan's tutelage, we kind of could make sense out of it. Obviously, the people who came after me really actually figured out how all of this works, and there continue to be questions about how even a simple enzyme like alkaline phosphatase carries out its reaction. Again, I thought the chapter was closed. I would move on to study other things. But of course, a few years later, you know, Dan's probably laughing at me because a student in my lab carried out, you know, performed the kinetic and thermodynamic analysis of DNA ligases. And I did just want to go through this because it is important to, you know, kind of to think about the steps. I think study sections don't recognize the value of the kinetic and thermodynamic uh, framework for an enzyme, but it really allows you to uh, kind of focus your questions and, and focus on the areas you don't understand uh, about a problem. So Bob Lehman was the one who actually showed that uh, all DNA ligases on this planet basically use the same mechanism. They either use NAD or ADP. ATP and they they adenylate the active site lysine of the enzyme. And so there's a first chemistry step to form an activated enzyme. They can then bind to DNA, transfer the AMP group from that lysine to the 5' phosphate to make a 5' 5' five prime phosphoid hybrid linkage. Um, and this then is attacked by the 3' hydroxyl to form a phosphodiester backbone releasing AMP. And so he worked out the chemistry of these reactions, but didn't have the tools to actually study rate constants to do transient kinetics and really be able to dissect how this works. And I think they are interesting enzymes because they have large conformational changes to form three different active sites to carry out these three, uh, three reactions. So a quick summary of what I'm going to talk to you about in case I run out of time. Uh, but all the studies of fidelity of DNA polymerase is well established. We understand a lot. You were taught it in biochemistry. The textbooks t tell a lot about this. I don't see any textbooks that talk about the ligases contributing to fidelity. And so today I wanted to talk about the discrimination between clean ends of DNA uh, breaks and also damaged or mismatched 3' termini. How do ligases uh, tell the difference there? So comparing a reaction here, which is a normal reaction, we want to have to hundreds of thousands of times every time their cell divides versus all these abnormal reactions that can happen. And I'll focus on adoxoguanine here, which is the most common oxidative lesion, because several previous papers have really showed that DNA repair polymerases that don't do proofreading put in adoxoguanine into the DNA. So this is going to be posed physiologically as a substrate for DNA ligases. I'm going to show you that ligases do discriminate against these damages and talk about the role of a hydrolase called aprotaxin, which works as basically a ligase-mediated mediated proofreader of DNA polymerases. It can directly reverse that adenylated intermediate that I just talked about to regenerate the same substrate neck, and then other processing exonucleases can do end repair reactions to be able to effectively keep these damaged or mismatched nucleotides out of our genomes. And so although we've studied this all along, I think these mechanisms weren't understood. 
I just wanted to, this is a collaboration with the group at NIHS, two really talented postdocs who've done a lot of crystallography on DNA ligases that's really helped to guide our thinking into how ligases work. So we had a structure previously in 2004 from the Ellenberger lab that was at low resolution. So by years of trying to optimize the crystals, Scott's lab was able to get down to 1.5 angstroms resolution where now you can start to see magnesium ions. And I'm going to ignore the active site magnesium ion that's shown here and focus on this structural magnesium which popped out of the structure. So in soaps, this is the tightest binding uh, magnesium site, and I'm going to call it the high fidelity uh, 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 magnesium because it binds right at this junction between these three domains. So ligases wrap around DNA with a DNA binding domain and ventilation domain and OB fold. And all ligases that we know of have these three folds. They're sometimes circularly human permutated. Uh, and so it's really an intriguing site. It forms an inner sphere coordination to the phosphate backbone to one of the glutamates and also a water-mediated hydrogen bond to another glutamate. So it looks like it would really help to hold ligase together. Um, I did want to point out that the site's conserved in all the replicative ligases that we call DNA ligase 1s. But humans have two other DNA ligases, ligase 3 and 4, which don't conserve that site. And so it helps us to start seeing how the different ligases are specialized in the way they attack their substrate. So Dan's laughing at me here because although I try to avoid RNA, RNA is important in biology. Um, and when you look at the active sites of ligases, what you see is what they do is they force the B4 of DNA to become A4 of B DNA. And of course, we know that double-stranded RNA likes to have an A-form geometry. You can see the C3 prime endo configuration of all of those uh, sugars leading into the active site. And so for the, if anyone is a proponent of the RNA world hypothesis, you might say this is intriguing that the way all our bodies put together uh, DNA by ligation is they make it look like RNA so it can be ligated. And I actually showed as a postdoc that, that ligases actually prefer slightly RNA on that upstream end. It's probably a non-physiological uh, reaction, but it just speaks to the importance of that uh, conformational change. So I just wanted to point out, so here's what it looks like in a different representation, that high, high fidelity site magnesium. Through a network of interactions along the DNA, this leads back into the active site. So you can imagine it could regulate activity. This is just a space filling representation. So what we did is we mutated those two glutamates so that that metal would not bind. This is a structure showing the magnesium's not there and there's basically a hole opened up in the protein structure. But the DNA configuration is exactly the same. So although that might, a double alanine mutation might seem non-conservative, it really doesn't seem to perturb any of the structure. And when we looked at that catalytic activity, this is a ligation assay where a nick DNA, which runs here on a DNA chain gel, can be ligated to form a product band up there. You can see this actually slightly faster as a ligase than the wild type enzyme. Uh, with these damaged substrates, 8 oxo GC and 8 oxo GA, um, you can see that an abortive intermediate builds up. The ligase will adenylate the end, but then fall off, not going all the way to product. So it seems like falling off is actually a way to um, provide some fidelity here. Um, and with the 8 oxo GA, we get a mixture of going all the way and falling off some of the time. Reactions. And this mutant, under all cases, is basically a less uh, high fidelity enzyme, so it's more, uh, it's more willing to ligate the improper substrates. And quantifying a whole bunch of enzyme kinetics, uh, the, the catalytic efficiencies for these different substrates is higher for the mutants, so by, by removing the site, it actually becomes a more active ligase. Uh, but of course, it's not doing as good a job of discriminating against these the mismatched or damaged ends. Um, this is showing the ligation efficiency, which is really a measure of uh, whether it goes on to complete or falls off and releases the dentalated intermediate. And you can see the mutant is more efficient at going on to ligate even these improper uh, nicks. Um, so we were never able to get a crystal structure of these uh, mismatches or adoxoguanines in the wild type enzyme, but with this mutant, since it accommodates them better, we got a nice structure. And this is just showing crystal structure with adox and G. Uh, bound is an adox and G pair. It adopts what you'd expect as a Hoekstein geometry, which is one of the reasons polymerases have trouble distinguishing against adox of one. Uh, and if we take that DNA from the mutant structure and superimpose it with the wild type enzyme such structure, you can see the clash that would happen in the vicinity of this high fiber magnesium site. So it really seems like this site has put some strain into the DNA that prevents uh, improper substrates from being able to react efficiently. So we've also done the transient kinetics on these systems just to show that, in fact, on a normal substrate, the mutant is just as good as wild type. All the microscopic rate constants that you can measure the system for those different chemical steps are almost the same within error. 
So really, it actually doesn't exert any effect on the chemistry, but it's exerting an effect on the overall conformational changes in the DNA that allows ligases to do their reaction. So I talked about there's an enzyme apertaxin, which when it's mutated, uh, people get neurodegenerative diseases. This enzyme's been shown by Steve's West lab to be a hydrolase, to be able to take an intermediate and, uh, and hydrolyze it. Uh, this is just showing ligation reactions in the absence of apertaxin that I showed you before, where the wild type enzyme will build up an adenylated intermediate on that adoxo GC substrate, consuming substrate. And if we put in just a one to tenth dose of apertaxin, it completely blocks all of those reactions. So we think what's happening is there's a futile cycle of ligase trying to adenylate, forming the adenylated intermediate, falling off. The hydrolase removes it very rapidly and efficiently, and it looks like nothing's happening. Now this mutant, as you might expect, is not as high fidelity, and so even in the presence of apertaxin, it continues to ligate substrate. Uh, it suppresses the amount of abortive ligation that goes on, so we no longer see any um, adenylation intermediate, but it is still able to ligate even in the presence of apertaxin, which makes sense with the structural models we have for what's going on here. I just wanted to point out, this is true for all the mismatches and oxidized substrates we looked at, but point out, if you do this on normal GC match substrates, you can see that there is a cost to having this editing mechanism. So apertaxin is stealing away the intermediate from wild type, and so there's a little bit of suppression of the catalytic activity. And so, of course, the real suppression would depend on the levels of the ligase, the levels of apertaxin, and many other factors within the cell, but you can see how any proofreading mechanism is going to require energy. So if what I told you was true, then we should be able to look at that transfer step. You would think an enzyme that wraps around the DNA would be holding onto it, and you wouldn't have access with another protein. This is the structure of apertaxin shown here, how, how it is binding to the exact same site that Luggies is binding to. So we took advantage of a catalytically dead mutant, H260N, which has been previously shown to be dead, so that we could see what it was doing. So instead of just reversing the reaction, we'd actually build up and stabilize the intermediate. And so now in the transient kinetics, what we can see is that in the absence of apertaxin, I'm almost done here, we build up the intermediate and then eventually we'll ligate together. If we throw in this mutant of apertaxin, it is able to steal away the intermediate and then we form only a ventilated intermediate and no ligated product um, with apertaxin and the ligase water mixed together. And of course, as I told you before, the mutant, the mutant then is compromised for this ability. So our explanation for that is that conformational changes within the protein DNA complex are opening up and giving access to apertaxin together. So I already gave you the conclusions up front about what's going on here with fidelity. We showed how this HiFi site is important for it, um, the intrinsic fidelity of DNA ligases, and we've learned a lot about how they're distinguishing different types of mismatches. Um, but also we've highlighted now this role of apertaxin as being basically a proofreader of these processes. Whereas previously, we all thought of it as a DNA repair enzyme that would deal only with adenylated DNA as a, a, a form of DNA damage in neuronal cells. And so there's a possibility here in these tip, terminally differentiated cells that in fact you are continuing to get mutagenesis via these, double, these single strand breaks and ligation pathways. So I want to thank Tom, who's the student who did all the kinetics that I talked about, our collaborators at NIHS. And happy birthday, Dan. Thanks for all the advice you've uh, given me. And I really am holding out for even more words of wisdom. Your words this morning were nice, but tonight hopefully we'll get some, some more words. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Yes. So what are the human enzymes that don't have, that have the mutations in those catalytic sites? What do they do? What do they do? They do different things. So one of them doesn't do anything, it's ligase 4, it's involved in non-homologous end joining, which is known to be a low fidelity ligase. So this is an enzyme that will slam together double strand breaks, even if there's imperfections there. So that one makes perfect sense. And there was just, we don't have as good structures with that, there's just a structure from Scott's lab that came out this summer on ligase 4 that starts to give some of those details, although there's more to learn there. Ligase 3 actually is our mitochondrial um, ligase. It also goes to the nucleus, and it, reconfigure that whole region, and we actually think it's doing something similar to have high fidelity using a lysine instead of a magnesium. So again, kind of supporting the principle that having a really rigid architecture is beneficial to being able to better, you know, read out whether bases are mismatched or not. So I think what we know of the human ligases actually makes sense. One is low fidelity, and the other two are high fidelity. Only ligase one seems to be metal um, proficient. So people who study RNA know about structural metals all the time. 
Um, this is kind of unusual to be a structural magnesium, but it seems to be doing just what a lysine would do. But yeah, good question. Um, so, so does, does that mechanism, the mechanism predicts that if you put in like an A basic or a or a or a nick in the middle, then the magnesium site or is no longer going to help you with fidelity. Which would be real. So it's, 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 one, of the, one of the many things that's unique from the from the talk, other than the bad pictures of humans, <laughs> um, was that um, that or pictures of bad humans um, <laughs> is, is, is that um, you're using the rigidity of a nucleic acid to communicate structural information from one, you know, along, I don't see how many base pairs. Along it's four base pairs, yeah. So, so, so that's really cool. So a prediction would be that if you put a mismatch or nick or a basic site in the middle, that, that communication would be broken, and now you'd be like, it's paid oxygen better relative to the other one. We've got that experiment planned, but we actually haven't done it. It's a little tricky because there's so many contacts with the DNA. So there will be secondary effects of disrupting the structure of the places. So we're, we're actually a little, you know, we're going to try some different things, but it's a more complicated experiment uh, to, to do that. But yeah, that's our prediction. I agree with you. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. A couple more.